Welcome to In Our Time, Robert Hurwitz in conversation with Julia Bullock. I'm Richard Kessler, Executive Dean for the College of Performing Arts and Manus School of Music at the New School. In Our Time is a partnership between the New School and the UCLA Center for the Art of Performance. I'd like to welcome all of you here today for this beautiful conversation between Bob Hurwitz and Julia Bullock. If today's conversation is anything as good as the conversation at the very first inaugural program with Bob Hurwitz and Caetano Veloso, you are all in for a very, very special treat. I would also say, I hope that you'll not only enjoy today's program, but that you will sign on for the program two days from now when Robert Hurwitz will be in conversation with the great Laurie Anderson. So please join me in welcoming Bob Hurwitz and Julia Bullock. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and welcome everyone to our talk today with the great American singer, Julia Bullock. I could think of a dozen different ways to introduce Julia, but I want to focus on two accomplishments that have made an enormous impression on me. The first was her role as a curator, performer, and advocate at New York's Metropolitan Museum in the 2018 and 2019 season. She presented five remarkable concerts, two of which were solo programs featuring Julia. History's Persistent Voice, a recital presenting slave songs in new settings by female composers, and Pearl Noir, Meditations for Josephine, a tribute to Josephine Baker. The other three were a rare staging of El Cimarron, Hans Werner Hens's oratorio about a runaway slave, a dream deferred Langston Hughes and song, an evening of music set to the words of Hughes, and a brilliant new version of John Adams's El Nino called Nativity Reconsidered. Those fortunate to see all or some of these programs witnessed a series of concerts that spoke about the music of our moment. Julia's series not only brought attention to black performers, composers, and poets, but moved beyond music to create a powerful narrative that reflects a world that many of us rarely see or think about. The second aspect of Julia's career that has made a deep impression on me has been her work in the opera productions of John Adams and Peter Sellers. Her first performance on a none such record came a couple of years ago when she took on the role of Kitty Oppenheimer in Dr. Atomic, where she not only transformed the role, but made a tremendous contribution to our understanding of this remarkable work. Her El Nino restaging as part of the Met series was one of the most extraordinary and inventive performances I have seen in a long time. And at this very minute, John Adams is writing a new opera for her based on Shakespeare's Anthony and Cleopatra. Two years ago, she had the lead role in the opera Girls of the Golden West. Let's watch a brief moment from her world premiere performance in San Francisco in the role of Dame Shirley. to take a bird's eye view of outdoors. First, a large pile of gravel prevents me from seeing anything else. But by dint of standing on tiptoe, Peter Sellers has said, this is who we've been waiting for. You see someone 
who's not just a vehicle, but an agent of change. She's actually moving the whole art form into a new relevance, both by completely rehabilitating existing repertoire and by commissioning a set of things that need to exist. We're hearing the voice of a new generation. Thank you, Julia, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Bob. <laughs> the first thing I would like to talk to you about today is something that is in the, that, is, that is in the minds of every musician on the planet. A career is suddenly put on hold because live performances, recitals, concerts, opera productions are getting canceled or postponed. In fact, one of the things that has been postponed that I am especially and painfully aware of is the full recording of Girls of, Gold, of the Golden West, which was scheduled this spring by the Los Angeles Philharmonic to be released on Nonesuch. Before the pandemic began, you had one of the most active schedules of any singer in the world. How have you adapted to this moment? Just, just adapted. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I've done it uh, well or quickly, but um, honestly, it's been a, it's, it's been good to just slow down a bit. Honestly, yeah, I, I think we are. Many of us were running sometimes in in course and in step with one another, but a lot of us were also just kind of driving our own way and, and not really considering the impact that we were having on one another or um, carefully reflecting on the work that we were putting out in the world um, and the amount of resources also that we were using in order to make that work happen. And I'm really, I, I'm, I'm appreciative now that it's like it's it's every single person is taking this moment of quote unquote pause right. to reevaluate right. and also become more insistent about the kinds of work that they want to make and how they want to make it. I mean, I when all of this when COVID erupted worldwide, I was in this state of <laughs> I guess disappointment in myself, to be honest, because I thought, oh my gosh, I haven't prepared. Everything that I've done thus far has been about collaborating with other people in real time and in space, sharing space together. And I'm not prepared to make anything at this moment. And, and I was feeling creatively really um, frustrated. But, you know, I then, of course, you know, I, I do live with a wonderful musician. I live, I live with my husband, Christian Reif, and, you know, he's a, a great conductor um, and also a beautiful pianist. And, yeah, we just started to make music at home. I mean, I guess it was kind of one, one way that I was adapting and appreciate not taking the time that we had together for granted and also just as musicians cherishing this moment. So we started to record videos in the house and um, out of just, you know, reading through a bunch of material and saying, gosh, this really speaks to this moment. Do you want to lay it down <laughs> on, our, on my iPhone? Do you want to lay it down? <laughs> um, so that what was, kind of, yeah. What kind of pieces? What kind of music? Um, well, we, we, song, song literature. Wow. Um, yeah, we started with Schubert and, uh, moved through Oscar Brown and Connie Converse and yeah. Carol King. I mean, it's really, it's, yeah, right. the, the, just, yeah, so, songs that spoke, spoke to me or spoke to him, so. And when you use the word reevaluation, yeah. um, where do you see this leading possibly as mm. this moment is gonna pass? Hopefully, yeah. soon, mm -hmm. hopefully. And um, how, when, when, have you thought about when we come out of it and live performance becomes reality again? Mm -hmm. um, how you've, you've benefited from this period of reevaluation. Are there gonna be changes in the road? Are you gonna be moving into new directions that you might not have thought about 
when you were living in that life of every day is compressed time um, where you have too much to do, too much to learn? Yeah. Um, well, I don't, oh, how am I, how, what is, what are the changes? I mean, I guess it's like, I am still working. It's like the, the work has changed a bit, you know, it's, and I, I, I think before this time, I wasn't thinking so much about, um, about like the impact on the planet of all the traveling I was doing, right. you know, um, uh, I was, also just really, I'm now it's like in, in even just in creatively like, all right, if we're, if we're dealing with this new virtual space, how can we make what we're offering audiences feel like uh, there's nothing that's going to replace live performance, but is there a way to transmit this hype, this powerful, powerful art form over a virtual space that feels legitimate, that feels um, vital. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been very cool to be in conversation now with other artists about not just like what to make in terms of content, but how to make it <laughs> and deliver it. Um, is that answering your question at all? <laughs> is that well, it, it sounds like a work in, a work in progress. To progress. Yeah, yeah. But you did, you did do a, a live concert recently in Denmark. And I have, what was, I have. how yeah. was that? How was just that experience and having real people sitting in the audience? It was after, I mean, it was, so I, the first, I guess, live concert I did, at least with working with a, a, a large group of musicians was in Berlin. Um, yeah. And I performed uh, Knoxville, summer of 1915. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was the first live stream and it was a very intense way to, to throw myself back into the performance right. realm. Right. Um, also with live interview and all of this, it's like, it's not, it's not something that I did very often. Um, but then to be in Aalborg in Denmark and have an audience of 500 people, it was the, the difference between having no one in front of you. I mean, of course you're trying to create and generate this amazing feeling um, uh, with the musicians that you're, you're with on stage. And even if there are just a few people in the audience, even if it's just like the cameraman, you know, you want you, that's, that's still somebody to communicate with. Um, yeah. But the difference of having an audience there was, it was palpable and I, I felt immediately at ease. I was actually surprised. <laughs> I was surprised at the, the pressure that it relieved to just know that whatever, yeah, I could just be present where I was and they could be present where they were and we were in some sort of exchange. Um, hmm. <laughs> as, as a singer, for whom language is of paramount importance. Mm -hmm. Have you found that the words that you've sung have changed their meanings because of the moment we're living in right now? In some instances, that they take on a different kind of meaning or that there yeah. was some vision that, they, that, a, that the person who wrote the words might have had that may not have been intentional at that point, but speaks to this moment. I think that's what, like, that's the definition of what a classic work of art is. <laughs> like, yeah. you, you know, it's like, if the material can speak to the present yeah. happening, right. but then at any point in history, even if it's just your own, his, your own life, you can right. return to the piece and it still carries relevance or somehow another aspect is illuminated because right. of the current circumstances. Like, that that I guess all the, all that proves to me is that it's a real it's a real classic work of art right. and um, I think you know I that is why I can call myself very proudly a classical singer <laughs> it's like because I'm I'm looking for classics <laughs> I'm, uh, that's what I want to devote my time and energy to right. yeah. to learning and music studying that, music that transcends any moment that will speak obviously into the future and, and speaks to us today. Mm -hmm. and, and have there been any lessons you've learned from this period of time? Mm. 
So many, um, so many lessons. Um, yes, I mean, I get one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that my value and worth is not just wrapped up in my performance. And I think I've always known that in some way, but I, I didn't realize like how important it, it was or it is actually how important it is for me to acknowledge, and I think for every artist to acknowledge that your body is and the the what you your output is not actually the only thing that it makes you an artist, and it's not the only way that you can value yourself. Um, I. I have been honestly, like, I guess just disappointed in, in certain institutions from some ex, you know, recent experiences that I've had and, and that it, it, it showed the fact that like all of the oppressive, discriminatory, supremacist, hierarchical, patriarchal things that we're talking about in our you know, in government right now, those are translated directly into our institutions. And they play out in obvious ways and also in not so obvious ways. And, and it's, I, honestly, I think that's been, I don't know if that's the thing I've learned, but that's been the greatest disappointment that's to like, this has been the, I, I, an important discovery, but it's been a disappointment. and. Um, but again, I'm really grateful. <laughs> like, I'm grateful that I'm, I'm grateful to know that because it's, you know, most of the, most of the interactions that I have, I've been so lucky over the course of my life creatively and every, all of the collaborations that I've had, I felt very much welcome to share of myself fully and to feel very much heard. Um, but that is not something that I can take for granted ever. And yeah, as, as, as good as I thought I was at like maneuvering through certain spaces in our world and in our industry, it's like I, I was reminded very rudely and quickly <laughs> um, how, how far we have to go. And um, uh, yeah, that's been, that has been hard, honestly. That's knocked me pretty hard during this period. But a, a, a positive thing though that I have learned is that with all of the ideas, like creatively, whatever that I, I do want to do, it's like, and all the, again, all the opportunities I've been given and I've had a lot of privileges because of them. Right. Um, I can now make space, I'm now in a position to make space for other artists to create and to have space. And I'm very excited like to be making this shift in my life as well. No longer thinking, all right, if I have an idea for a project, of course it's my voice and it's my body that needs to be delivering it. It's like, no, actually maybe there's some other performer or creative spirit who can live this project out. Yeah. And that has been such yeah, wow, I, 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 I love that that shift happened because it's not something I was thinking about at all <laughs> before COVID-19. I was definitely, I mean, I was, I was still kind of programming with my, my soul being in mind and, um, or at least somehow directly involved in every part of shaping it. But yeah, that's, that's changed, that's cool. Well, I, I just want to throw in a couple of comments um, based on what you've just spoken about. The first is, uh, has to do with the larger issue of presenters in general, which is yeah. when we come out of this, I think the landscape has to change. I think the optimist in me says this is a rare opportunity where we could right the wrongs on many, many levels that have um, gone through 
um, so many of the cultural institutions we've dealt with, knowing at this moment, at the same time, the enormous burdens, financial burdens, that whether it's orchestras, opera houses, jazz clubs, um, rock venues, um, uh, in so, so many, a non-for-profit theater that has been um, put on the verge of collapse because of this. But it's going to re but but people are going to want to go back and see the live performances. There's no doubt about it. I didn't even talk about theaters, that that is going to. But there's that as I said that optimist part that makes me hope, hope that when things come back, there's going to be a clean slate, and we're going to have the experience of everything that's happened in the past that may help us um, create a better landscape. The, the I think other that's thing demand that it does, Bob. It's like I don't. I can't even. I. I, can't, I think I have to just demand that it will. And I think what this is what artists are doing now. I think yeah. actually, not just artists, but everyone <laughs> who, uh, yeah, so many people are are demanding that now. And, and go ahead. And by the way, this was pre-COVID an yeah. issue. It's not just yeah. now. It's just. For 20 years, people have been talking about what's the future of so-called classical music, about mm -hmm. orchestras, about programming, mm -hmm. about inclusiveness, about finding an audience. I always used to joke when I was 20, I'd go to the New York Philharmonic and everyone would be older than me. And then when I was 40, I'd go to the New York Philharmonic and everyone would still be older than me. And when I was 60, you know the punchline of that joke. Um, and how are we going to in all of these forms, create an audience that is actually not going to go there just because they think it's what they should do, but go there because they love what it is. And right. the other thing I was going to mention from an earlier thing you said in, in, in a, a few moments ago is, is you were talking about yourself not just being Julia the singer, Julia the performer, but someone who was looking at a wider vision. And I think that's what you did at the Metropolitan Museum, because the, the five events actually became something much, much larger than each individual part. And it was a larger statement um, <clears throat> about things that in all the years I've been following music in America, I never saw happen at that level mm -hmm. with that much consideration. So, and, and you spoke about that, I think, um, I saw a clip um, when you were at the, speaking at the graduation at Eastman, where you spoke again about people having a larger vision of what they could be and what they can't be. Um, and I, and I, I think that's one of the things that I've always appreciated about you, that it's bigger than just what we used to think a singer is going to be in the world. Mm. Well, I, I've had a lot of help also i just i have to i really i, I can't underscore that enough because right. yes as I, I think i along the way even early on in my thinking about what classical music meant it's like yeah. i the first operas that i watched um on dvd at home when i was in high school what were Peter Sellers' productions. And I thought like, oh, uh, well, this just helps me understand what stage classical music can be and the commentary that it can have. It hadn't, it had not clicked for me. And again, I was like just learning about classical music, but those were the first impressions that I had of the, as you're talking about like speaking to the moment and then, yeah. you know, flying yourself back in time and then charging forward. Um, it's like, it, it did all of the, it accomplished, you know, his work in so many ways accomplished so many of those things. And um, I, and then to have then the opportunity to work with him to also, I mean, at the Met Museum, yes, I mean, I really took my time in researching that place and, and, organizing myself and like polling my friends to see if there are projects that they wanted, you know, they were dreaming of doing, but maybe couldn't do, hadn't, you know, couldn't, didn't have an opportunity to do anywhere else yet. Um, but I also worked with this tremendous presenter, Lee Mortomer, and she gave me so much freedom to, she's like, 
dream as big as you want. <laughs> that, was her, that was what she said. Dream as big as you want. And when I asked her, what is, why do you, what is the importance of having a performing artist in a space that is dedicated to visual art? And she was like, I'm looking to, to um, break down or, or uh, remove the uh, barriers of entry. And, and I felt like, okay, well, how do I live into that vision? Like that's her, that was a vision that she had. And again, I don't know if I accomplished that, but it's like, it's these kind of, I, I've, I've been surrounded with people who are also thinking in a broad way. No, sorry, it, it's not, and I'm not just like broad strokes. Like, yeah. and here's just, you know, here's, here's some subject matter that I, I hope you're, is um, gonna ignite something in you. It's like, it's really, you know, thoughtfully, worked and and mined but i i um the, those those are the individuals who i i guess have sought me out and who i also seek out um you know that was just i just want to comment on that beautiful story of i guess watching peter's mozart operas as a teenager mm -hmm. as being your entry point which speaks to modernism I mean, I've worked with a lot of incredible composers who in the beginning were trashed by critics and other composers and other musicians. But for people who grew up 20 or 30 years later, that all of a sudden, there was never, it was never anything new anymore. That was just the language change. And artists today, even though sometimes there's a blowback about, um, new work because it doesn't fit the idea of what happened in the past, that eventually a new generation is gonna come along. And the standard is gonna be Peter's Mozart operas as much as Zeffirelli's Mozart operas or anyone else's Mozart operas. And it's going to change the way we think that we're not stuck way in the past of what it used to be, but we're, 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 we're actually living in a present. And the, the musicians of today will have a big impact on people who come along 20 years later as what the standard is. This, the, the, the goal line keeps moving in a yes. certain way. Absolutely. And it takes, and that's, I think one of the great things about today is that in my lifetime, I have found a larger number of young artists coming out of conservatories or doing it on their own in all forms of music who are not being held back by this kind of rigid genre only way that I grew up with, where there was really no separation. You were either a classical artist, you were a jazz musician, you were a pop artist, you, whatever you were, you were locked into that. Hmm. And I think that that has really changed. But um, anyway, I, just to move on a little bit, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about what we're going through right now. Um, partially beyond music, but obviously having to do with music. You know, we've had a, a lifetime's worth of troubles in America. I know you're, we're speaking to you in Germany today. Um, and the troubles were here, well, there were lots of troubles before February or March when COVID hit. It's not as if we were living in this kind of idyllic life um, before March 13th, when kind of the whole world fell upside down. Um, but that was just the first of many earthquakes that we've had to experience. Um, we've also, you know, we sometimes forget we're also living in a depression-like um, economic disaster for a large segment of the American population. We're in a moment when the racial justice movement has grown exponentially after the George Floyd killing. There's a political crisis in this country with an election happening, by the way, two weeks from today. And well, <laughs> the country in some ways may be at the edge of democracy. None of these problems have gone away. Every one of them has intensified in this last seven months. You've been living in Europe all this time. How have you been able to cope with everything that's going on, especially in America? I'm feeling distant from what's happening but also like so deeply bound. 
and it is really hard being this far away from the United States right now. Cause I, I, I do, st- I mean, I'm trying to establish myself at being home here, right? right? I really am, but it is so difficult to focus on the establishment of myself in, in this, co- on this continent right. <laughs> in Europe right. and not feel like I'm somehow abandoning home, right. you know? And I know I don't have to, and I'm really I'm so grateful for this age where I can get on a call or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, WhatsApp, whatever, but it's, it's so odd because I, I know that, it's like, what, what really can I, there's again, this frustration Right. Because I, I'm not feeling paralyzed, actually. I'm not feeling paralyzed wondering, what do I do? What do I do? It's just like, I can't physically be there to do all the things that I want to do. Right. Um, so how, how do I constructively take that energy and put it somewhere or give it, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's, um, I think I've always been very vocal in my work, like in putting uh, putting my values as a human being into the work that I do. Um, and I guess I'm I'm now just having to clarify again and again. Um, that it's not just about the performative work, the artistically crafted work. It's like all of every single, the platform that I have and the continuation of the learning that I put myself through daily, because that's actually, that is my craft, right? It's not like I, um, I, I was thinking about the, just the word opera generally, sorry, I'm veering off maybe a little bit, but just thinking about the word opera and that it means work literally, right? And I was like, okay, so what is the work that I do? Well, I am learning all the time. I'm educating myself all the time, whether that be in languages, whether that be about poetry, uh, history, and putting all of this work into context, the music, learning about my voice. Um, And it's like, that's, my work is about learning. And so when I think of opera companies now, and it's like, if their work, I mean, not that, again, not that our values have to be the same, but it's like, if their work is not about learning and encouraging that to be central to their mission, it's like, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I can call that an opera company. I don't know if I would, or I at least, I maybe I don't want to be associated with that word anymore. And it's not that I'm having an identity crisis. I'm just like trying to figure out what in the, as you said, where the where have we just been going and assuming and not like, not continuing to re, re, redefine and like obsessively work to make sure that whatever, whatever it is we're saying we're doing, we're actually accomplishing and checking ourselves. Um, cause this blindness and, and moving forward in an ignorant way, it's, 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 it's just not going to fly anymore. I think, and that is the, that is the most beautiful thing that has happened at this moment in history for me that I've seen. It's that nobody is willing to accept anyone's ignorance anymore and it's yeah. okay. You know, it's like, and Yay! Hooray! 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 Like, that's uh, one of the pluses of the digital landscape we live in today. That's, yeah. that's there are many minuses as well, but that's one of the pluses. In fact, speaking of the digital landscape, yeah. uh, could you? There was an article that you posted on Facebook um, mm-hmm. that was around the time that the uh, federal agents were going in cars and kidnapping people, and um, you you all of a sudden. Um, 
that story took on a life of its own. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I posted this article because I was also just trying to keep myself informed about what's going on across the country with the Black Lives Matter movement. And all that I wrote on that post also was just, please read this. Because I, I was so shocked by the federal government's use of and misuse of their power uh, to, yeah. And um, then I am um, uh, <laughs> the namesake of the Richard Tucker Foundation um, who's also on their board, not hyperactive member of the board, I came to understand later, but on the board, um, came onto my, my personal Facebook profile and, and this article and started posting racist, violent comments and also untrue, sharing untrue statements um, about protesters and that they were the ones inciting the violence. And um, I very politely responded asking him to please refrain from posting on my wall uh, untrue things. And then um, <laughs> uh, tagged the Tucker Foundation. I, I did, that was, I don't think before this time I would have done that. Um, but I just tagged the Tucker Foundation and asked like, very simply about like, this is the, this, if this is the kind of, I don't even remember the exact words I used to be honest, but essentially I was just asking them if this is the sort of bias, whether conscious or not, and if this is the sort of behavior that is, um, exists within a, the board, I wonder what the impact, like, how does that impact decisions for the organization? And because of course these, the, the culture of, of an administration <laughs> determines a lot of things. We know this from our, the presidency, right? It's like, um, and I went to bed and I, when I woke up, um, the next day, I saw that the entire, it seemed like the entire opera community had clued into what was happening on this post. And um, I was really amazed uh, because there's, again, nobody's like wanting anyone to go out and, and go out alone. I mean, it's like, it's like, no, every, everyone's kind of taking the time now to care for each other. That's one thing. I think that's another positive thing in this digital age. There's can be a lot of time and uh, spent not <laughs> taking care of each other in this digital space. But when given an opportunity, I, I again, this feeling of community was incredible. It was incredible. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, I did not ever ask for this particular board member to be fired, um, but I, within 48 hours he was. And, and some of it, I mean, I know that from now, now after having these conversations, there was, a, there was already a decision being made amongst those most active in the board about um, his removal. And then though at the same time, this, uh, wonderful young group of artists um, that came together, the uh, Black Opera Alliance, um, they also put out this public statement saying like, we see you, we hear you and unacceptable. Like I, I, it was really awesome, <laughs> I have to say. And, the, and, and also just from individual artists. So I'm, I, again, I wasn't, I wasn't asking anyone to come to my aid because I was also reaching out to the board myself. Right. But I didn't, I guess the beauty is like, I didn't have to carry, I didn't right. have to carry anything on my own. And people were, yeah, again, this shared moment of, of wanting to make some change happen. Yeah. Um, but again, it comes down though to follow through, right? Because we still, 
you know, you can change the face of something, but that doesn't necessarily change the realities of what um, mm -hmm. happens in that, like <laughs> in the action afterwards. So, and that's, that's, that's the part that's ex exhausting. It's like keeping up and, and, and the insistence of that. Look, you, I think everybody recognizes that even if Trump is kicked out of the office, uh, out, of, out of the presidency in two weeks, that struggle is not gonna just stop that day. And things like what you've just described are gonna be for the rest of our lifetime. There are gonna be challenges. Um, with the prospect, there is a prospect of hope in this moment that, that there's gonna be enough people who are going to all of a sudden just think about their actions um, not just in the present, but in the past, um, and learn from, from what is going on. Um, speaking of learning, um, I witnessed this remarkable program that you made um, recently, uh, since certainly since I don't remember when it was, but I only saw it a few weeks ago, called This Human Moment. And for those out there, you could find that on the internet, and it's about... Um, I don't know if it's actually, I, I don't know if it's released yet, actually. It's I, on I the internet without, without oh. a song, okay. but okay. I, but you could find it. Where you spoke of both the challenges and the advantages that you found in your career as a black woman and as a singer. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about, um, just briefly about um, what that program meant to you and how, how you came to the ideas that you presented, which were, as far as everything I've ever seen, completely unique. Hmm. in terms of, of the narrative that you formed that really talked about two separate identities that you've experienced um, as a human being. Yeah. Well, um, honestly, it came, out of, it came out of a couple, you know, when the pandemic was going on and, and after George Floyd's death, um, there were all these panel discussions that were starting up and, and I had you know been asked to participate in several of them and one of them uh, was just a conversation between uh, myself and this one and this uh, wonderful soprano who I, I've worked with a few times uh, Karen Slack and in this she it was called Kiki Kiki conversations just giving her a shout out um, <laughs> and um, uh, she asked me and you know I had told her before we even started, I was like, I'm feeling very tired and I, I, I don't wanna, I'm not sure how much energy I have to go deeply into too many things. And she's like, it's fine, you know, take your, do as you want, this is, you know, your time. And, but she asked me point blank fairly early on in the interview, um, what, uh, why do you think that you've had opportunity, so many opportunities and maybe I have, and I have not. And in that moment, I wasn't, I didn't like track. I, I wasn't clocking what she was asking me about privilege. And honestly, I don't even know if she was clocking it herself. But when I looked back to review it a week later, I thought, oh my gosh, I missed this moment to talk about the privileges that I have, or the unearned advantages that I have had throughout the course of my life by having a white mother and a, a black dad. I mean, I'm, I'm of mixed heritage. Uh, I'm a light skinned black person, brown person. <laughs> um, and I've also had advan an advantage because I, of my white adjacency growing up in predominantly white spaces for most of my life and understanding how to maneuver through them. Um, I spoke a little bit about this before, I guess, in this, in this talk. And um, I went on like a, I started just writing a bunch uh, about it um, because I had spoken to individuals about this. I'd spoken even to other students about this and some of my colleagues, but I'd never spoken publicly about it. And um, it then I, when this, this offer came to me to participate in this program, 
uh, or this this these episodes of this human moment, um, I they asked if I would help to organize or come up with an exercise that would explain the increase of privileges in my life, or sorry, just privilege and the levels of privilege that one can experience. And then also when that privilege starts being taken away, um, what, that, what that means, what that looks like. And I, um, I had, again, help in organizing this, um, but it was one of the most important moments during my, just this human moment. It was just one of the most important moments for me to also like organize in my mind how I have benefited from white supremacy <laughs> and also how I have been and benefited from the delusion of white dominant culture. And it's like, <laughs> and I'm in a classical music world where the, the, like, the level of delusion around white dominant culture is extreme. It's extreme. Um, and also it's very hard to like penetrate and break because many people who are in the classical music world are under this assumption that they are somehow enlightened because of the fact that they are exposing, you know, they are immersed in this material that is timeless and like, and that speaks to all human beings, speaks to all of their deepest truth as human beings. And yet some of the like great, atro like uh, the associations with the classical music world historically, it's like, I, I, I'm, um, it was just all very, it's all been very, troubling and sort of surreal to now also take on the responsibility of trying of like not just understanding that for myself but also like trying to make that clear for other people and it's not I, I again I don't I don't have all the answers here but I um and even just the opportunity to speak about it is a privilege it's like a privilege in itself giving, giving give, being given space to share my perspectives about this is a privilege. Um, but it's a responsibility that I have to take super seriously. And I do because it haunts the hell out of me. And in the same program, it wasn't just that you had privilege, but you faced certain circumstances with people who were just utterly insensitive to who you were and treated you poorly. Um, one of the stories was almost scary. Um, the art presenter where you ended up staying. So um, what, what, what I will say about when you said, well, sometimes we do too many videos or Zooms or whatever. <laughs> I, I think that many of the things that people are doing now are going to age incredibly well. Yeah. And people are gonna come, I think and that's one program that I could imagine for years to come, people will come back and look at because it, it, it says something about our life, not just our life in music, but our life in general, that I think people, it's, it's, they're lessons that we all still have to learn. Mm. And it was a remarkable um, um, moment to be a witness of. Um, I just want to um, say that I've purposely, for the sake of this program, referred to you as a singer, as opposed to a soprano, because some people always will put soprano next to your name. But they don't put soprano um, um, next to Ella Fitzgerald's name for some reason, <laughs> or tenor next, next to Frank Sinatra's name. But right. with opera singers, they have to put something to sort of define you. Mm. And I haven't called you an opera singer or a classical singer. You have a little bit. But in fact, you are all those things. You are a classically trained soprano who sings an opera. Mm. Um, and in the last couple of months, you and I have been talking about a record and um, your first solo recording, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> so and, am I. And, I'm so, really I'm really my whole damn life for <laughs> to do it. I really. <laughs> I'm very happy to hear that. But it's clear to me from all those conversations, the music you've sent me and the things we've talked about, 
that you have no interest in being put into a box or any kind of genre, that you're a singer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I am, I am. Yeah. And I yeah. just, I have a lot of interests and, and influences and I don't, want to, I don't want to abandon any of them, you right. know? Um, because it's like, yeah, I can turn on a recording of Ella Fitzgerald and it'll help inform how I want to deliver uh, a piece written by Poulenc. It's like, I, I can, I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? And, um, I, I even think of Nina, you know, Nina Simone is, uh, yeah, I started listening to her in high school, I think 15, 14, 15, and, and, and then when I started studying classical mu music and I was like, She's, she's improvising a Bach-like impromptu here. Wait, did she, and she, it's like, and she studied classical music? She did? <laughs> and, she, and, even the, the, and she didn't abandon any of her influences either, you know? It's just all, um, and honestly, now when I think about the composers that I'm, I'm commissioning more, you know, more recently, like Rhiannon Giddens and Cecile McLaurin Salvant, and, and it's like, they study classical voice. Yeah. They have predominantly written for themselves up until this moment in time. Right. Um, but there's, uh, again, the influences and how they write, how they use their voices. I, I I'm just, I, I feel like it's, um, it's not a free for all, but man, it feels really liberating <laughs> to, to not feel I have to choose. I can just, I can just be and, and as, as I have embraced so much music and allowed myself to be influenced and, and imp like as, mu as much impression has been left on me. It's like, why, why, why close off? Why compartmentalize? Yeah. Um, because there's so many ways that one can express, particularly with the human voice. Oh my gosh. You know, um, when I was talking about with hope for the future, I think you are of a generation of people who grew up with this enormous uh, variety of things. And mm -hmm. I think I've always found the most interesting artists are people who are willing to be influenced by other people and sort of take everything in and what comes out is a very individualized voice as opposed to a copy. And I, that's something that when you mention Rhiannon and Cecile and yourself, that all of you have that, um, have, have had all that learning that's gone into. I remember the first time Rhiannon came to the Nunsuch office, she mm -hmm. saw a poster of Nixon in China and she started singing the news aria. <laughs> I don't know if her, I, from Nixon, you know, and I only knew of her as kind of a bluegrass uh, right. folk musician. <laughs> and it, it said something to me um, that I don't know if you might have seen that in the past as much as it's prevalent today. So, I think and that it is, I think that it has, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Bob. I think that it has, been, at least, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to think like on this, the performers I adore and the, inf and, and when they've talked about who they love, it's like, it's a wide range and the inspirations yeah. come from all over the place. Um, and those are the ones who continue pushing the art form forward. And there are people who love who they love because they love them. I know that sounds a little bit convoluted, but it's not <laughs> because they love stuff because it's cool to love it. They love stuff because it's actually deeply affected them and yeah. sometimes pushed them into different directions um, in terms of music. Um, I'm just looking at a clock and we're going to probably um, have to tie this up. It's just been wonderful talking to you, um, you. Julia. And um, one, one thing I will say that, that I'm sure you have to feel very fortunate about is you've lived with your husband, a musician in Munich, who also is a fabulous pianist. So you actually have had, without having to go outside and go through all these things, right in your living room, you've been able to continue making music. And I'd like to um, end um, with um, Brown Baby, um, with your husband, Christian Reif. Um, and I know you wanna say a few words about this piece before we 
um, sign off. But again, thank you. It's just been a wonderful hour I've been able to spend with you. I, yeah, just, Bob, can I just say one thing? I just, um, again, I, I don't want to talk about it, the album that has not yet been made yeah. yet, right. but I, I'll just say what was so cool in our conversations initially is you just said, what do you, speak to this moment, speak and share something that is of yourself and that only can come from you. Mm. And um, I, I just, and let the album itself be a work. Yeah. It's not about trying to use it as a commodity to sell yourself or even to sell itself. Like it's a work of art, create something. And I was like, oh, this is just, this is the conversation I've been wanting, dreaming of having with, with anyone in the record business. And it was, wow, it just, I, anyway, I just wanted to say, I'm so okay. grateful for that. I, I get, anyway, so grateful for that. And it may yeah. happen relatively soon. It might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that's not By like the way, all you Americans, about. it's something that we might be able to do in Germany. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, um, but yes. Anyway, back back to Brown Baby. Brown yeah. Baby. Um, this uh, this song. I, again, I I grew up with. I, I guess, um, or at least became very aware of while I was in early in, on in high school, and um, I programmed it for the first time on a, my debut recital tour, which was in 2014. It was while I was still at Juilliard and I just won the Young Concert Artists competition. And, um, uh, and I, I was a part of a, the second half of a recital program where that I was talking about the demoralization and objectification and dehumanization of Black women in particular. And I opened the second half of this recital program with Josephine Baker's songs, went into Mo Salvage, Mo Salvaje, and then went into these civil rights songs and spirituals to close. And I, so in 2014, I'm programming the song again, it was about the context, like the context presenting the song in this particular context. Um, a few months later, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson, Missouri, um, you know, St. Louis, where I'm, I'm from. And I thought, all right, when the Black Lives Matter movement came onto like the international, in, into international consciousness, I thought, all right, like, I may never have to sing this song again. It's a beautiful song, but how amazing if I won't ever have to sing this song again. And then, well, we all know the history that has continued since, sorry. And um, the events that have continued to be so demoralizing and so dehumanizing and so devastating. And I, when Ahmaud Aubrey uh, was murdered, I thought, okay, and it was, it was Mother's, Mother's Day was coming up and I thought, all right, I'm gonna record this for Mother's Day because I need to do something. I need to, I need to sing this, I don't know how, but I could not get my body and mind around delivering this song. And then uh, George Floyd, was murdered. And for some reason, I just like every, I, it just, um, it's like I had, I had, I didn't just need, need to song, need to sing the song to process for myself. I was like, this is, this is taught, like everything about it was just, I had, I just needed to get out to the world. So, um, anyway, I recorded this with my husband by my side and, in our living room, yes, in Germany, but um, it was written in the 1960s, has been recorded by so many wonderful artists. Um, and yeah, I'm just, anyway, I don't know how much more I need to say about it, but you can hear it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
When out of men's hearts hate is hurled Maybe, baby, you live in a better world Thank you.